And yes, it just said recording in progress. And I wanted to tell you that this morning session will be recorded and but not the afternoon. So some people were asking that in the in the chat. So this I, I would like to introduce our um, guest. And Shannon D. Williams is an associate professor of history at the University of Dayton. She is a historian of the African American experience with her research and teaching specializations in women's religious and black freedom movement history. Dr. Williams is the author of the forthcoming book, Subversive Habits, Black Catholic Nuns in the Long African American Freedom Struggle. And it will be published by Duke University Press in May of this year, 2022. Dr. Williams research has been supported by a host of fellowships and grants and awards. Her work has been published in the Journal of African American History, American Catholic Studies, the Washington Post, America Magazine, Catholic News Service, and the National Catholic Reporter. She's a distinguished lecturer for the Organization of American Historians and author of an award-winning column, The Griot's Cross. She's been featured in the Future Church series, Women Witnesses for Racial Justice. We are pleased to have Shannon D. Williams as our presenter this morning and this afternoon. Shannon, welcome back to Baltimore. And would everyone please mute yourself now for this presentation. Shannon? Thank you so much for that introduction, uh, Joan. And thank you all for joining us uh, this, this morning and for today's presentations. Um, before I begin my formal remarks, I would just like to take a moment to thank Call to Action and the Racial Justice Circle for bringing me here in celebration of Black, History's Month, Black History Month um, and for the opportunity uh, to share my research um, really in the presence of everyone, but especially uh, the leader of the Oblate Sisters of Providence um, many of you who have read my work know um, that I have championed the work of the nation's Black sisterhoods, um, and especially the Oblate Sisters of Providence, who in many ways pioneered, um, not in many ways, did pioneer the teaching of Black and Black Catholic history within the church. Um, so I'm really grateful for the opportunity to share today, um, and I'm excited um, about the conversations to follow. I'm going to share my screen. Okay, don't see my one second. Just give me one second as I try to share my screen in my presentation. Are you co-hosted? I am. Um, okay. For some reason, it's not showing up though. It happens. It actually just happened earlier this week in New Orleans. So should be able to figure this out. There it is. Great. And can everyone see? I think so. Yes. So yes. the title of my presentation today is The Real Sister Act, Why the Stories of US Black Catholic Nuns Matter. And as I mentioned, um, it is wonderful to be in community with members of the Oblate Sisters of Providence as they were uh, the first representatives of the Catholic Church to teach um, and to really popularize Black and Black Catholic history uh, within church boundaries. Um, the teaching of Black history and Black Catholic history in itself has always um, had a political dimension simply because so much of this history had been suppressed, um, not simply within the church, but within wider society. And Black sisters understood fundamentally uh, the connections between, between teaching Black history, knowing Black history, and the larger African-American freedom struggle. To be able to deny a people their history also helps and aids in the effort to deny them their most basic civil and human rights. And so by teaching African-American history, developing curricula to ensure that their students' uh, education was supplemented that instilled racial pride, but also was grounded in historical truth-telling um, is something that the Oblate Sisters of Providence and the members of the African-American Teaching Sisterhoods should be always celebrated for, even though they do not always get that credit. And indeed, I, I'm not sure that I would be in this point today um, without the great work of the sisters. Certainly, my own journey to teaching and researching the history of Black sisters in the United States 
was not, I would say, expected when I went to graduate school. Um, I really came to my project, my current project, by chance, although I think it's better to talk about it within terms of uh, providential serendipity. And so what I want to do today, before I move into the formal presentation, is to give you a little bit of background on how I began to research and write about the history of Black sisters. Then I'll move into my presentation and then take as many questions as time allows for this first presentation. So subversive habits really began as an attempt to make sense of an extraordinary news story and photograph that I stumbled upon in early 2007. At the time, I was perusing through microfilmed editions of Black-owned newspapers in search of a little known dimension of the American past. And while scanning through a roll of the Pittsburgh Courier, I finally encountered a 1968 article announcing the formation of a Black Power Federation of Catholic nuns called the National Black Sisters Conference. The article's title alone, Black Sisters Way Contradictions in Christian and Secular Community, immediately piqued my interest. However, it was the accompanying photograph of four smiling Black Catholic sisters that steadied my hand on the microfilm reader that day. Up until that moment, I, a lifelong Catholic, had never seen a Black nun except in a Hollywood film. In fact, the only Black sister that I knew at the time was Sister Mary Clarence, the fictional character played by Whoopi Goldberg in the critically acclaimed Sister Act film franchise. Deeply ashamed of my ignorance, I soon learned that I was not alone. Even my mother, who had attended Catholic schools for the entirety of her formal education, and who in 1974 became one of the first three Black women to graduate from the University of Notre Dame, was unaware of the existence of Black nuns in our church. No, only white nuns taught us in our schools, my mother relayed to me on the telephone later that evening. But I wish I had known. I wish we'd had Black nuns in Savannah when I was growing up. Stunned by my mother's revelation, I set out to learn as much as I could about the National Black Sisters Conference and to understand the roots of the invisibility of Black Catholic sisters in our lives. And my mother is in pink, as I note on the slide. Mm -hmm. Father Cyprian Davis's landmark study of the U.S. Black Catholic community, I discovered among many things that there had discovered among many things that there had been Black nuns in my mother home, my mother's hometown of Savannah, Georgia, in the late 19th and early 20th century. Before anti-Black prejudice and violent, violent threats pushed these holy women out, members of two separate all-Black sisterhoods had helped to lay the foundations for and ensure the survival of the city's Black Catholic educational system. Their heroic efforts had made my mother's and by extension my own journey into Catholicism possible. Yet the white sisters who taught my mom and hundreds of other African-American children in Savannah during America's civil rights and Black power years never once alluded to Black sisters in their lessons. According to my mother, her white instructors did not teach any Black history or art either. And after writing and calling a host of Catholic institutions to drag down some of the women, sisters and ex-sisters who established the National Black Sisters Conference, I finally began to understand why. The sock of America's black women who dared to be poor, chaste and obedient is largely untold. It is an uneasy story, not only because it is rooted in the American dilemma, racism, but also because the position of woman in an oppressed group is traditionally delicate and strategic. Now, by the time that I interviewed her, Dr. Sean Copeland was a distinguished professor at Boston, at Boston College and the first African-American president of the Catholic Theological Society of America. She had also been out of religious life for 13 years. But in the 1960s and 1970s, Dr. Copeland, who was the first African-American Felician sister in Detroit, Michigan, and later was an Adrian Dominican sister, had been one of the National Black Sisters Conference's most visible leaders. She had also done more than anyone else to preserve the organization's memory in the face of marginalization and erasure. In addition to publishing the first scholarly article on the National Black Sisters Conference, Dr. Copeland in the early 2000s had arranged for the deposit of the organization's papers at Marquette University. I'm so glad you're interested in the Black Sisters Conference, Dr. Copeland expressed to me during our first conversation. We've been waiting on someone to tell this story. And while Dr. Copeland's willingness to share her experiences with me proved pivotal, 
It was Dr. Patricia Gray, the organization's founding president and one of the four nuns featured in that Pittsburgh Courier photograph who radically changed my focus and my book's focus. Routinely described by her female and male peers as one of the most intellectually talented and charismatic Catholic sisters of her generation, Gray, who was known in religious life as Sister M. Martin de Porres, had been the MBSC's heart and soul in its formative years. And as Pittsburgh's first Black religious sister of mercy and the conference's public leading public voice, she had also been the face and force of the new Black nun. However, in 1974, she abruptly departed religious life and stopped getting, giving interviews related to the organization. I don't like to look back, Dr. Gray frequently repeated during the first of our many conversations over the years. However, after I presented her with a copy of a recently published book on Catholic sisters activism and the black freedom struggle of the 1960s and 1970s, she quickly changed her mind. Visibly frustrated by the book's erasure of Black sisters' vanguard activism and the Catholic fight for racial justice, its cursory mention of white sisters' longstanding practices of white supremacy and exclusion, and its glaring omissions about the one Black nun briefly discussed in its pages, the 65-year-old uh, ex-nun stood up and departed the room. Several minutes later, she returned with a treasure trove, her personal archive from her time in religious life. And in handing over the materials, Gray revealed that in the 1970s, the National Black Sisters Conference's executive board had desired to publish a book documenting Black sisters' history in the United States. She also lamented the enduring visibility of Black sisters' lives and labors in the church and wider American history. Then in her great wisdom, Dr. Gray gently encouraged me to consider expanding my attention to the mostly unsung and under-researched history of the nation's Black sisterhoods. We, the MBSC, were not the first Black sisters to revolt in the church, she quietly declared. If you can, try to tell all of our stories. And so in my book, I recover the voices of a group of Black American church women whose lives, labors, and struggles have been systematically ignored, routinely dismissed as insignificant, and too often reduced to myth. For 13 years, I went in search of the untold stories of the nation's Black Catholic sisters, and I found no accounts bearing any resemblance to the fabled Hollywood tale of Sister Mary Clarence. I also failed to encounter Black sisters whose lived experiences confirmed many of the existing narratives of American Catholicism or the master story of Catholic sisters in the United States. Instead, from a host of widely ignored archival sources, previously sealed church records, out of print books, periodicals, and over 100 oral history interviews, I bore witness to a profoundly unfamiliar history that disrupts and revises as much of what has been said about the US Catholic Church and the place of Black people within it. Because it is impossible to narrate Black sisters' journeys in the United States accurately and honestly without confronting the church's largely unacknowledged and unreconciled histories of colonialism, slavery, and segregation, I address these violent systems of power and exploitation and their perpetrators, male and female, directly. In so doing, my book recovers an overlooked chapter in the history of the long African-American freedom struggle, a tradition of sustained Black Catholic resistance to white supremacy and exclusion that most scholars argue does not exist. When confronted with a silenced past, the greatest responsibility of the historian and the most radical thing any person can do is to tell the story that was never meant to be told. So my book, Subversive Habits, marks a new turning point and starting point in historical truth telling in the Catholic Church and wider American society. For far too long, scholars of the American Catholic and Black past have unconsciously or consciously declared by virtue of misrepresentation, marginalization, and outright erasure that the history of Black Catholic nuns does not matter. And offering the first full survey of Black sisters' lives and struggles in the United States, my book unequivocally demonstrates that their history does matter and has always mattered. In the United States, which will become home to the modern world's first communities, Roman Catholic sisterhoods freely open to African women, African descended women and girls. Um, the story of this formation begins 
as much of the history of the American Catholic Church, that which in what becomes the United States in the American South. We know that there have been eight historically black sisterhoods that were organized in the United States. All were founded in the South and all but one were or were slated to be teaching communities. But significant about the story of the black sisterhoods, even though we know that it will require the formation of black sisterhoods to make religious life possible for the vast majority of black women who entered religious life in the United States, it's important to remember um, that prior to the successful formation of these communities, there were vocations that were lost. Beyond the anti-Black admissions, admissions policies of white congregations, perhaps the greatest testament to the ferocity with which white Catholics rejected Black religious vocations is the fact that historians cannot say with any certainty who the nation's first Black Catholic nun was. The realities of racial passing and archival erasure suggest we may never know her name or the exact circumstances of her life. What is clear is that the first African descended women and girls known to profess consecrated vows in the United States in 1824 in the Holy Land of Kentucky were not the first to seek entry into religious life. In 1819, for example, a priest from New Orleans, Louisiana, wrote the inaugural Bishop of Louisiana and the two Floridas and offered, quote, a few girls of color desiring religious life, unquote, to support the US branch of the Society of the Sacred Heart which had been established in the Missouri Territory in 1818. In response, the US leader of that community, who is now St. Rome Philippine Duchenne, um, uh, responded and was willing to accept these women, but only in a subordinated way. We know that she was willing to accept them only as servants to her community. And although she was willing to allow these young women to wear the regular habit of the order, she requested that they be admitted at a third class status below their converse sisters who performed manual labor and the choir sisters who taught in school. For his contribution, the inaugural Bishop of the Louisiana Terra and Florida Territories, Bishop Dubourg, um, encouraged Duchenne to only uh, admit candidates who were of mixed African and Native American descent, who he declared might otherwise be reduced to prostitution. The slaveholding Dubourg, who went on to found an academy that became St. Louis University, also suggested that any black candidates be admitted to a, sub -sort, to a sub sort of subaltern profession with a different habit than the Converse sisters. For her part, Duchenne's um, superior in France agreed, but only on certain conditions. We know she writes back, do not make the foolish mistake of mixing the whites with the blacks, you will have no more pupils. The same for your novices. No one would join you if, the, if you were to receive black novices. We will see what we can do for them later. Now, this community will not accept its first African descended member until after World War II, and she will be accepted in New York City. Um, a young woman who had also, who previously desegregated a college that the order ran um, in New York City. What's very important though, is that in the correspondence of Philippine Duchenne, we know that she is still receiving requests from girls of color who are wanting to leave the world so much so that she's even considering creating an all separate auxiliary community to be able to accommodate these requests. And certainly what I've learned very recently is that among these girls of color who are seeking admission into religious life are at least one member um, or one woman who was enslaved by the community whose name was Eliza Nesbitt. Um, so it's not simply free girls of color feeling called to religious life, but also those who are enslaved by the church um, who are being called to religious life and experiencing rejection. Religious life will finally become possible for black women in 1829 with the formation of the Oblate Sisters of Providence in 1890, in 1829. Um, they are founded by Servant of God, Mother Mary Lang. Um, and they are founded in Baltimore, Maryland, specifically to address the need for young children of color, both free and enslaved, who are being denied admission into the schools in the city. Also significant about the story, early story of the Adelaide Sisters of Providence, even though they are founded in 1829, 
what we know from their male founder, Father James Jobert, Father James Hector Jobert, um, in his diary, he tells us that these women had actually been waiting to be called to religious life and that they had experienced some form of rejection. He wrote, quote, for more than 10 years, they had wished to consecrate themselves to God for this good work, waiting patiently that in his own infinite goodness, he would show them a way of giving themselves to him. Now, it's important to understand, he does not say which communities rejected the founding members of the Oblate Sisters of Providence, but there are only three communities that precede them in the Diocese of Baltimore, which is the nation's first diocese. They are the Carmelites in Baltimore, they are the Visitation Sisters in Washington, D.C., and they are the Sisters of Charity um, led by St. Elizabeth Seton, um, who are also um, in nearby Emmitsburg. Father Javert also documents the profound resistance that the inaugural Oblates uh, encounter, both within uh, the Baltimore community and especially within the church. He wrote, quote, I knew already that many persons would approve of the idea of a school for, uh, school for pupils, disapproved very strongly that of forming a religious house, and could not think of the idea of seeing these poor girls, colored girls, wearing the religious habit and constituting a religious community. He even notes that some of his clerical counterparts considered the idea of black, black sisters as, quote, a profanation of the habit, unquote. Despite that resistance, the Oblates will be successful in forming themselves into a religious community and soon beginning to admit women called to religious life, <clears throat> but who were barred admission um, from the, the nation's white orders. Also significant about the Oblate Sisters of Providence, they are a non-slaveholding community, which makes them unique among their sister counterparts in the diocese of, uh, in the diocese of Baltimore, and in, indeed across the United States um, prior to 1850. Indeed, what is important about the story of the Oblate Sisters of Providence is that in addition to not owning enslaved people or not relying upon the labor of enslaved people in their own lives, we know that prior to the Civil War, they admitted at least eight women who were born into slavery um, into their ranks, um, but had achieved freedom. Um, and in one case, they actually took a woman who was still enslaved and who was able to gain her freedom uh, just before she professed her vows. And so this makes the Oblate Sisters of Providence the first US Catholic sisterhood to reject the racist and sexist notion that a woman born into slavery lacked virtue, lacked the virtue necessary to enter religious life. The story of Servant of God, Mother Mary Lang, and the early Oblate Sisters of Providence also serve as essential counterpoints to those who attempt to defend or excuse their slaveholding and segregationist peers as simply people of those times. We have to remember that the Oblate Sisters of Providence are people of those times, and they do reject this institution of slavery. And in the case of one of their uh, earliest ex-slave sisters, this is Ellen Joseph West, um, who came into the community, um, lived until 1903. In fact, at the turn of the 20th century, she was believed to be the oldest Catholic sister living in the United States. And so there were a host of news stories written about her um, appearing in various newspapers, including the New York Times. Also, the community today does uh, preserve the manumission records of those sisters who began their lives enslaved in the United States. The second successful community of African-American sisters are the Sisters of the Holy Family, founded by Henriette DeLille, who is one of six African-American candidates currently under consideration for canonization. Um, she founds her community in New Orleans, Louisiana in 1842. Mark is the official date, although we know that they began their formation process in the 1830s, um, specifically 1836. Like their counterparts, in Baltimore, the inaugural Sisters of the Holy Family will face severe resistance to their presence um, within the church in New Orleans. We also know that this community is also rejecting slavery in very significant ways, but also the system of concubinage that was known as plissage, where European men would take Afri African descended women um, in what we consider sort of a common law relationship Many of the members of the community understood that as a form of sexual exploitation. In part, many of them were products of this system of concubinage that existed in much of the French controlled territories of the Americas. Um, and of course, in the case of Louisiana. 
also significant about the Sisters of the Holy Family is that they are the first congregation of sisters founded in the state of Louisiana. And there were sisterhoods that preceded them um, in ministering in Louisiana, but all of those communities had come from Europe. Most of them had come from France and their mother houses were in France. So the Holy Family Mother House would be founded in, um, in Louisiana and specifically in New Orleans. And from their first history, we know, um, we have a sense of some of who, who these women are. Um, their first historian, Mary Bernard Deggs writes, quote, all the sisters were the very first families of the city and only one, Sister Suzanne Navarre, was a stranger from Boston. As for the rest, they were all natives of this state, but their fathers were all foreigners, some French, Spanish, or German. They were descendant from the first settlers of Louisiana. And this is significant for a host of reasons, not only with the Sisters of the Holy Family, but also with the Oblate Sisters of Providence. Their stories, their roots in the Caribbean and in the Southern United States remind us that there have always been two transatlantic stories of American Catholicism. One that begins in Europe and another one that either begins in Africa or with African descended people who are living in Europe who arrive in what becomes the United States. Indeed, we have to remember that the story of the American Catholic Church does not begin in the urban North, but in the South. But also that the story of slavery and what becomes the United States begins under Catholic auspices. 16, 1619 is not the year that slavery begins in what becomes the United States in Virginia. That's where it begins under English Protestant controlled territory. Slavery is already existing in what becomes the United States under Spanish Catholic auspices almost a century before. The first successful settlement that becomes a city is St. Augustine, Florida in 1565. In fact, we know that in 1565, there are free and African descended people who are a part of that arriving party. And baptismal records and marriage records in the Diocese of St. Augustine today tell us among many things that Christian marriage was inaugurated in St. Augustine, Florida in 1565 by a free black Catholic woman from Seville, Spain and a Spanish soldier. So when focusing on and telling the stories of black sisters, we are forced to grapple with the African foundations of American Catholicism. Like in Latin America and the Caribbean, Catholicism was the first black articulation of Christianity in what becomes the United States. And indeed in the stories of the founders, of founding members of the Sisters of the Holy Family, we see it. We will also very much see it in the Oblate Sisters of Providence and a story that I'm gonna tell this afternoon. But in the case of Henriette de Lille, we know that she is the great, great granddaughter of Claude de Bruyere, who was the inaugural French Royal Engineer, whose crews of free and enslaved men built many of the first roads in New Orleans, built the first canals. They also built the old Ursuline convent. The old Ursuline convent for the Ursuline sisters who were the first Catholic sisters to minister in what becomes the United States is built by enslaved people. The Ursulines own over 200 people. Also significant is that they will not accept black women, including someone like Henriette DeLille because of her African heritage and her unwillingness to pass for white. We also know that the sixth member of the Sisters of the Holy Family is a descendant of the Spanish Catholic Pintado family. And the Pintados were, among, was, were the family that surveyed much of early Spanish Florida and Spanish Louisiana. The sisters also document the resistance that they face from other sisters within the community, um, within their local community. And unlike the Oblate Sisters of Providence, the Sisters of the Holy Family were denied the opportunity and the privilege and right to wear habits uh, for the first 40 or 50 years of their existence. We don't actually know exactly when they are allowed to sort of uh, profess their vows and wear habits. But when they do, certainly by the 1880s, um, they are met with profound resistance at every level of leadership within the church. Sister Mary Bernard Tex tells us that, quote, we had a very hard time for we had many enemies who wanted to degrade our dear little community as poor as we were. We were persecuted by the sisters of St. Joseph in the city. They tried all they could to make us take off our habits. This was after 45 or 50 years that we had worked and suffered to have a no one would think we were anything if we were not dressed in the holy habit. And from their second historian who sort of publishes their second history in the 20th century, the oral history of the community was passed down is that the sisters of St. Joseph were angry because they believed that the holy sister habit, when they finally designed it, 
was too similar to that of their lay sisters. And they wanted to ensure that the Holy Family Sisters, the first community founded in the state of Louisiana, would be recognized as the most inferior rank of sisters in the Archdiocese of New Orleans. Um, so sisters are deeply invested in ensuring, ensuring up white supremacy and, um, and ensuring the subordination of black sisters in the city. <clears throat> Nonetheless, they will survive. And if you can see my arrow, this sister right here is the sixth member of the community. This is Anne Fazenda. She is a descendant of the Spanish uh, Catholic Potato family. The third community that is still with us are the Franciscan Handmaids of Mary, of the most pure heart of Mary, which were founded in Savannah, Georgia in 1916. And then they relocated um, to the Archdiocese of New York um, in 1923. They are founded specifically in response to a bill that was introduced in the Georgia State Legislature in 1965, which would have banned white teachers from teaching black children and black teachers from teaching white children. And if this had passed, black children would have been barred from the Catholic educational system. So in response, a white priest who was ministering in the Diocese of Savannah um, first sends out requests to the Oblate Sisters of Providence and the Sisters of the Holy Family in hopes that they would be able to send some sisters in to be able to preserve black Catholic education in the city. The sisters do not have any sisters to send. They are already stretched thin. And so he goes across the country in hopes of finding a pious lay woman who can found a community. And when he's in Washington, DC, he is uh, told by a priest at the Catholic University of America about a woman named Eliza Barbara Williams who was working for as a domestic for the Sisters of Notre Dame de Demure at their Trinity College, which is now Trinity Washington College in Washington, DC. She was working as a domestic for them. She'd actually been a former assistant superior of a failed black community in Convent, Louisiana. And then she had spent some time as an oblate novice, but then was out of religious life. According to his sort of recounting of it, he has a handwritten account of his first meeting with Eliza Williams. He tells her, he tells us that he tells her exactly what has happened in Savannah. And he tells us that she leaves the room, goes back, comes back with her life savings and tells him that she will be in Savannah as soon as she can get there. And within six months, she's in Savannah. And within a year, she has recruited black women, um, some from Savannah, one from Cincinnati, um, to come into the community to ensure the survival of Black Catholic education in the Diocese of Savannah. Um, this community will recruit women from within the Deep South, but also from the, Car the Caribbean. That is also true with all of the Black sisterhoods. Um, the Black sisterhoods are not simply saving the vocations of Black women who are denied admission in the United States. They're also preserving the vocations of Black women denied admission into European and white communities in Canada in Latin America and the Caribbean. Indeed, one of their earliest members taken in Savannah um, is a woman who was raised by the Carmelites in Cuba. In Latin America, there were formal laws, blood purity laws, which came to signify a person free of African ancestry that denied the admission of African descended women and girls into those communities. And those, those policies will exist well into the 20th century. Some of them still exist. The last community that I want to mention is technically still a community, the static community, I just sort of say still to the present. Prior to 1922, if a black woman felt called to a, to a contemplative vocation, meaning that she wanted to primarily devote herself to prayer um, and sort of living in a very, very almost complete cloister from the world, there were, a few, uh, there were no communities that she could enter unless she could pass for white. Some communities are willing to sort of accept women who can pass for white or simply who are racially ambiguous because communities will take Native American women, they will take non-Black Latina women, they will take women of Asian descent. Blackness is the bar in communities. And so in 1922, there is in Baltimore organized uh, auxiliary unit of the Magdalens of the Good Shepherd Sisters. Um, these community, this community exists until the 1960s when they integrate into the Good Shepherd community. Um, we know very little about this community. I only can, I have these two photos. I'm not sure what else exists. The archive has not been able to sort of find much on the community. However, one Magdalene was still alive or at least a few years ago. And she was able to sort of give me um, a significant amount of information in terms of identifying most of the Magdalene's, um, giving, giving me their secular names as well as where they were born. So my book focuses on a host of dimensions of Black sisters' freedom struggles. 
Um, chapter two focuses on the roles that Black sisters played in desegregating Catholic higher education before the Brown decision, really after World War I. It focuses on the struggle to preserve Black Catholic education in the 60s and the 70s. Um, but one core element of my book focuses on this struggle to desegregate U.S. Uh, female religious life. And I do want to briefly give us some examples to underscore what is a core argument of my book. And that is that women's religious life was one of the fiercest strongholds of racial segregation and exclusion within American society. So that the struggle to integrate religious life in itself became a significant sort of battleground of the freedom struggle, that women's religious life was a significant battleground of the African-American freedom struggle. As we learned in the video, the Oblate Sisters of Providence um, will suffer during a crisis in the 1840s after the death of Father James Chaubert. Um, the Oblate Sisters of Providence in this moment of crisis will produce another community. Um, two members actually leave the community, three members actually leave the community to go on to found a historically white community, the first community in the state of Michigan, the Sister Servants of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, the IHM Sisters. The third sister who was supposed to join them uh, was not allowed to do so because they realized when they were in Michigan that they could only found a white community. And word was sent back to Baltimore to the third sister who wanted to come that she should not come because she was too dark and that she would reveal them. So of the leaders of the two group, the two sisters that left, the leader was a former superior of the Oblate Sisters of Providence and a former charter member, Mother Teresa Maxis Duchemin. Um, she will leave, go to Baltimore, travel to Monroe, Michigan to found the Sister Servants of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And she will be successful. Um, the community will grow. It will recruit significant numbers of women into their ranks, so much so that they expand their ministries into Pennsylvania. But Mother Teresa Maxis Duchemin is always in a precarious position. The bishops know her secret. Um, they oftentimes refer to her in their correspondence using racially derogatory language. Um, so much so, um, as she begins to run afoul of the bishop, she goes into exile in hopes of saving her community. And she's in exile for over, for over 15 years. And then in her old age, she's allowed to come back um, and she is buried in Pennsylvania. But after her death, the community um, enacts sort of a policy of silence. They erase their community's African-American heritage and founding. They cite a, the third member of the community as their foundress, erasing their two African-American former oblate foundresses. And then in the 1940s, they sort of somewhat admitted, but it's really not until the 1990s when the community adopts an anti-racist platform um, and apologizes um, for what they had done to erase um, their heritage and also opened up their archives specifically to acknowledge what they had done in terms of suppression and practicing racial segregation and exclusion. In fact, though, during this sort of period of uh, which the community sort of agrees to sort of a committed sort of conspiracy of silence, we even have one sister sort of writing in 1928, we are convinced that silence is the fairest, wisest, and most agreeable way of committing oblivion to this subject. In fact, we know that some uh, IHM sisters go so far as to close their archives after a Brooklyn priest had discovered who Mother Teresa Maxis Duchemin was and wanted to have her canonized. And they did not give him access to their archive because they knew that if he had gotten access to their archive, he would find out that she was of African descent um, because she had been a former Oblate Sister of Providence. One thing that I wanna note out here in this photograph this is actually the only photograph that exists of Mother Teresa Max Duchemin, again, a founding member of the Oblate Sisters of Providence and the chief founders of the IHM Sisters. If you go on their website, you probably will not see this photograph. Instead, you will see a drawing based on this photograph. And it's because Mother Teresa is not wearing the habit of the community that she founded. Um, this is not the IHM habit. This is the habit of the great nuns of Ottawa, Canada. That is where she lived in exile. Um, for over a decade. And so the photo itself documents that history of exile. And so um, the image that you will see of her is primarily an etching based on this photograph of her. There are other Black women we know who serve as superiors in the 19th century. This is Mother Mary Rosanna Whiteman, who served as a superior of the Sisters of Charity of New York. She is described as the most hidden of the Mother's General. Um, they know very little about her, um, believe that she was born in Charleston, South Carolina to either a free or enslaved mother and a British planter father. 
Uh, she enters this community, um, serves in various leadership positions before she becomes superior. But upon her death, one of her successors, went, according to the oral history of the community, that one of her successors went into the archive and attempted to destroy everything related to her except her prayer book and rosary. One photograph does survive though, which was given to me by the Sisters of Charity of, of New York. For those black women who we know go into white communities in the 19th century, those who were not racially ambiguous or could, or, and could not pass for white, all were forced to leave the United States to enter communities. And they all were forced to leave um, sort of enter communities on a subordinated, in a subordinated status. This is Frederica Law, Savannah, Georgia, um, who enters into the novitiate of the, the vision of the missionary Franciscan sisters of the Immaculate Conception in Rome. She was only allowed to be admitted at and trained as a lay sister, meaning that she would be relegated uh, to domestic labor within the community. She becomes sick um, and dies on um, and dies very soon after, but she was allowed to profess her vows on her deathbed. Uh, she was Sister Benedict of the Angels and is buried in Rome. Francis Johnson of Baltimore, Maryland, also entered the Franciscan sister. Uh, we know entered the novitiate of the Franciscan Sisters of Mill Hill in London um, in 1885. Um, she was believed, or she entered believing that she would be trained on an equal status, but the community decides to only train her as a tertiary, which in many ways is the equivalent of a lay sister. She professes her vows as Sister Xavier, returns to the United States to live um, and reside and minister in Baltimore. Um, until her death in 1894. The last sister that we know of who entered religious life um, uh, that we have sort of information for is Mother Matilda Beasley, who was the foundress of the first community of Black sisters in Savannah, Georgia. Uh, we know that she was from New Orleans, uh, Louisiana, somehow gained her freedom, made her way to Savannah, Georgia, where she married a, eventually married a free Black Catholic man and she herself converted to Catholicism. Upon the death of her husband, um, she uh, reportedly gives all of his uh, wealth to the church um, and begins to found ministries to the neglected African-American community. In or a short time before 1885, we know that she travels to York, England and likely entered a Franciscan order there to undergo novitiate training. By 1889, she is back in Savannah and she has founded a community, um, the Sisters of the Third Order of St. Francis in, um, in Savannah, which again is the first community of Black sisters in Georgia. By 1893 though, Mother Matilda begins, to, her community begins to suffer financially. And the Bishop of Savannah encourages her to travel to Pittsburgh, uh, to Philadelphia, uh, to meet with uh, a new, the leader of a new community um, that was, designed to minister in the African-American and Native American communities. Um, this were, these were the Sisters of the Blessed Sacrament founded by St. Catherine Drexel. So in 1893, Mother Matilda and her assistant traveled to Philadelphia in hopes of convincing um, Catherine Drexel, Mother Drexel to uh, integrate her community into the Sisters of the Blessed Sacrament. And it's in this moment that the Sisters of the Blessed Sacrament take a vote about whether or not they're gonna take that black women and they, uh, black women and they take the vote um, and they um, say that they're not only gonna reject black women, they're also gonna reject Native American women. Again, this vote is taken in 1893. And interestingly in the annals, um, what we know is the chief motivating factor is one, the candidates do not wanna live with black women and girls on equal, black, black women on equal terms. And they also cite what they call the innate sensitivity of the colored and Indian um, for that reason. Now, what's significant is that members of the Sisters of the Blessed Sacrament, including in sort of the, the push to have St. Catherine Drexel canonized, argued that the reason why the community did not take Black women was because of a request from the Black orders. And they specifically say it came from a request of a Black superior in New Orleans. Um, that Black superior that they named did not become a superior until the 20th century. This vote is taken in 1893, so it's not a true statement also was very significant in the annals. They describe Mother Matilda as a very saintly colored woman. And yet they say that they will not even provide novitiate training for her. Also significant is even though when they reject her, just a few weeks before the community had taken a Native American woman and they had accepted her as a house sister, meaning that she was relegated to domestic service. But as Mother Matilda comes in, the community takes the vote not only to exclude Native 
to exclude, exclude African Americans, but also Native Americans. And so from that point forward, they will track their Native American candidates, um, any sort of request to the other white communities willing to accept Native Americans, and then they will track their African American applicants to the Black orders. The community will not, the Sisters of the Blessed Sacrament will not accept their first Black members again until 1950, and they do so in response to a request from white priests who sort of meet with the, the superiors because um, they realize that some communities are beginning to accept African Americans and the sisters were still resistant to doing that. And so they told them that it looked bad. And when they take that vote in 1949, it's a unanimous vote, yes, but only with a stipulation that they would only take two or three black sisters at black candidates at a time because they did not seemingly did not want a black majority to develop because they are the largest sisterhood sort of ministering in the African American community. There are other examples of black women going into white communities in the 19th century into the 20th century. These are exceptional cases. Um, these are the Sisters of the Holy Family of Nazareth, a historically Polish community that ministers in the United States. Um, we know that their first US provincial adopts at least six mixed race girls from Catholic orphanages. Um, and at least three of those girls enter religious life. The first of whom who enters um, actually does not minister in the United States. She, um, Stella Charleston, who becomes their sister Mary Ann, enters in 1889. She serves in Paris and Rome. She also serves in Poland, but dies in Rome in 1963. The two other sisters that we have information for is we know that they served in Chicago, um, in Brooklyn, and Philadelphia. There are other examples. Um, in some cases, Black women, again, who are racially ambiguous, will get into communities. In most instances, white orders required Black sisters to, um, if they were going to admit them, um, basically, they would have to cut ties with their Black family members. But that would be a condition of, one, of one's admission. And some women sort of agree to it. Most women do not. And I do want to stress um, that the vast majority of African descent women who I know sort of were given that option refused to do so, including um, one superior of the Oblate Sisters of Providence, Mother Rebecca Clifford, who will be given an opportunity to enter a white community in Philadelphia on the condition that she cut ties with her black mother and she refuses to do so. Um, I'll also give you another case. This is Sister M. Frances Davis. She's Elsie St. Clair Davis. She was the 14th Mary Knoll sister. Um, she passed for white in the community, but we know from the annals of the community, their archival record, is that when she came in, she explicitly told the sisters that she would not be cut off from her stepfather and her half-sister who were Black. Um, and they are described in the annals as Black. And the founding members of the Mary Knoll sisters at the time, they were known as the Teresians, they expressed admiration um, for her. That being said, up until recently, uh, Sister M. Francis's sort of African-American heritage was cut out from all of the congregations sort of published histories, um, even in their online uh, sort of um, catalog of their deceased sisters. Not until recently have they sort of fully claimed her as their first black sister. There are other instances though, when black women are caught passing for white in white communities and removed. This is Mildred Dobear, who was a native of Mobile, Alabama, um, who was Afro-Creole. Uh, she enters the Religious Sisters of Mercy in St. Louis in 1929, is caught passing for white, um, and is removed. So what happens, she grows up in Mobile to an elite family. Um, even though they were Afro-Creole, they had been able to sort of fully integrate into sort of white society because of their wealth. Um, she was educated by the Daughters of Charity at their nursing school in Mobile. But we know from the record that she was not allowed to receive her diploma in public because the sisters feared that her grandmother, who they describe as uh, a pure Negro, Black in color, uh, they believed that she would come to the graduation, so she was barred. Um, after the death of her father, we see in the census records the family begins to move out of Louisiana, uh, move out of Mobile. They go to California, they go north, and begin to pass for white. And so, what happens after Mildred O'Dear enters the Religious Sisters of Mercy? Someone from Mobile writes to the Mercy Superiors in Washington, D.C., who then write to the Superiors in St. Louis to tell them that they have a Creole in their community and that they have to remove her. And she is removed. She's dismissed in 1930. But I actually found her in a community, a visitation community in Richmond, Virginia. Um, she entered that community in 1930, and she died in 1963. 
Um, she passed for white as a visitation sister. They never knew her racial heritage uh, until I sort of contacted the monastery and I had to sort of, sort of tell them I was asking for a photo, but they really wanted to know why I wanted the photo. And when I said that I believe that she was a woman of color, I never heard anything more. Um, but a few days later, I got a call from a member of her family. And it was an interesting conversation, very nice. Um, but initially, because the member of the family didn't know the racial heritage, they just wanted to ensure me that they were in fact white. And then I said, well, if you have the time, uh, we can go through the census records and I can show you where it happened. And she was very happy to know, the family was very happy to know. And that's how I got the photo of Sister Perot Marie. But even in those cases, I must say that these are exceptional cases. Most communities would not take black women um, regardless if they were racially ambiguous or not. Um, this is Sister Mary Alice Chenoweth, born Innocent Chenoweth. Um, she was uh, rejected admission into the community of her educators, the Sisters of Charity of the Blessed Virgin Mary um, in Rock Island, Illinois in 1934. In turn, she wrote to Mother Catherine Drexel, who also rejected her, but made her aware of the Black sisterhoods. And she enters the Oblate Sisters of Providence in 1936, and she will remain into the community until her death. And as I mentioned before, that is the story um, of many of the members who enter into the nation's African-American sisterhoods. Many of them were actually not educated by black sisters. They were educated by white sisters and then rejected admission into the communities of their white educators. And if they were lucky, they got directed to the black orders. But there are many cases in which white orders would not even direct their, their former pupils with vocations to the black orders and those locations were lost to us. And so what we have is a story of women sometimes traveling hundreds and even thousands of miles away from their hometowns to be able to enter communities willing to accept them. These are the Burke sisters. These are the children of Emma and Charles Burke of St. Augusta Catholic Church in Louisville, Kentucky. They had five daughters to enter religious life. Um, they were barred from joining the white congregations mm -hmm. in Kentucky. Uh, we know that five Burke sisters enter into the Oblate Sisters of Providence. Um, one gets sick and returns home before remain until their deaths. These are the prices of St. Peter Claver Church in Baltimore, Maryland. They had five children to enter religious life, four who became Oblate Sisters of Providence and one son who became a Josephite. The Josephites were a historically English community that came to minister uh, primarily to the African-American community after the Civil War. These are the Thomases of Akron, Ohio, but with deep roots in Lebanon, Kentucky, out of the Holy Land of Kentucky. They sent four daughters to religious life. Uh, the three oldest entered the Franciscan Handmaids of Mary in New York City. The youngest, Josephine, entered and desegregated the historically white Sisters of St. Joseph of St. Mark in Cleveland. Um, many of these women, many Black Catholics can trace their lineage to the earliest days of the church. Not only um, many of them have sort of European sort of ancestry, but certainly those who are descendants of the free and enslaved people whose labor and faithfulness built the church. In case of the Thomas sisters, they can trace their lineage to a black lay woman named Eliza Spalding Smith. Spalding, Eliza Spalding in her life um, before the federal abolition of slavery was owned by the extended family of Bishop John Lancaster Spalding and early Baltimore Archbishop Martin Spaulding. Also have ties to Catherine Spaulding, who was the founders of the Sisters of Charity of Nazareth, um, all slaveholders. Um, this is an image from St. Augustine Cemetery in Lebanon. Um, when I went there, um, I, in search of this particular uh, graves, uh, grave site, I didn't necessarily anticipate how I was gonna find it, but it was actually the first segregated cemetery that I've ever encountered. I went in, and it took me about a minute to realize that there was this huge area of the right side of the cemetery, most of which did not have sort of uh, headstones. When I realized that this is where African-Americans are buried in the, in the cemetery, but in particular where many of the former slaves of the church who built much of the Holy Land are buried, <coughs> um, including um, the family of Eliza Spalding Smith. It will not be until World War II that we begin to see pressure put on white orders to reconsider the morality and utility of their anti-Black admissions policies. We'll see contemplative communities take the first step. In 1944, 
uh, three members of an all-white uh, Dominican monastery in Catonsville, Maryland, will leave the community after their superiors reject the applications of two African-American women on the basis of race. In response, they leave to find the nation, found the nation's first racially inclusive monastery. They become the Dominican Sisters of Perpetual Adoration. Um, they are set up in the Diocese of Montgomery um, and they take their first African-Americans um, immediately after they are founded. For communities with a uh, public ministry, such as teaching or nursing, it's important to remember that that will take a little bit longer, but also think about the consequences specifically for Black women and girls who desegregate those communities. In addition to desegregating the order, they oftentimes have to desegregate their orders, colleges, universities, uh, schools if they are teachers, hospitals if they are nurses. Um, they oftentimes have to live and desegregate racial sundown towns. Um, where many white convents are located. And so it becomes a challenge and certainly of the pi first pioneering generation of black sisters who enter white communities, uh, many of them are only admitted on a segregated basis. Such was the case for the pioneering members of the Sisters of St. Mary who are now the Franciscan Sisters of Mary who are historically German community, nursing community in St. Louis. They accept five members, uh, for their first five candidates in 1946, and these women are only admitted um, in a subordinated way. Um, they build a separate novitiate for the communities for their black candidates. Their segregation is enforced in dining and socializing. The black candidates are not allowed to enter the mother house. Um, they can never even go to the mother house. And finally, after a while, when they are allowed to go to the mother house, they must enter through the back doors. They are even forced to profess their vows in a segregated profession ceremony. Um, there are multiple examples that I have of Black sisters being forced to profess their vows separately from their white counterparts in a segregated profession. Um, in the case of the Sisters of St. Mary, we have a photograph of their segregated profession. Um, I don't know if you can see it here. This photograph uh, was contained in the archives of the uh, Catholic University of America. I had this photo for a few years before I actually realized what it was. Uh, one, of their, one of the five was Sister Mary Antonia Ebo, um, who was a Selma March participant. Um, she had told me in her interview what had happened, and then I realized that I had a photograph of it. And then it took me another year to realize something else in this photograph. If you'll notice these women right here, those who I'm circling, these are members of the Oblate Sisters of Providence. The Oblate Sisters of Providence served uh, in the Archdiocese of St. Louis. Um, Beginning in the 19th century, they come to St. Louis primarily to minister to the church's longstanding African-American community, descendants of the African, uh, African enslaved African-Americans who build much of the church in St. Louis and then who are largely abandoned by the church after the federal abolition of slavery. The Oblate Sisters of Providence will found many of the early schools, both elementary and high schools for black Catholics in St. Louis. Many of the former pupils of the Oblate Sisters of Providence will go on to desegregate white communities but also members of the Oblate Sisters of Providence, wherever they were stationed, if they learned about a young black girl who was desegregating a white community, they made it a part of their ministry to make sure to be present at the investiture ceremonies and profession ceremonies of these young women in an act of solidarity. What I also know is that many pioneering black sisters in white communities would say, you know, when I was in the community and going through all kinds of things, what kept me in was, regular visits from members of the Oblate Sisters of Providence um, who would come and check on me to sort of see that I was okay and see how I was faring. And indeed, we also know that the Oblate Sisters of Providence will also preserve the vocations of several Black women who desegregate white hot borders, but find themselves in very hostile situations. And so they will transfer to the Oblate Sisters of Providence in the 50s, 60s, and even into the 70s. And as I finish up, I do want to give you a sense of the kinds of challenges that Black sisters would face, and particularly Black applicants would face, as white communities began to reconsider the morality and utility of their admissions policies. We begin to see significant pressure put on white councils, not only from the African American community, but by white priests who are ministering in uh, Black communities. After World War II, white sisters develop a host of strategies in an attempt to evade desegregation. Here are the general council minutes from the Religious Sisters of Mercy. 
um, sort of detailing um, some of the strategies that were used to evade uh, integration. Here, this noting, Mother Provincial of the Province of Chicago, Mother M. Genevieve Crane reported that she is being faced with the problem of accepting colored girls as postulants. Mother understands that a priest is sending in an application for two girls to enter the novitiate. The problem was discussed by the general counsel, but no action was taken. Mother asked the members of the general counsel to give it serious thought and fervent prayer. White priests themselves would oftentimes write individual letters to be able to ascertain the anti-Black admissions policies of white orders to spare the Black girls in their parishes the pain of the rejection, that the priests would take the rejection for them so that they would not be discouraged in the vocations. Here's a letter from Father John F. O'Brien, who was the pastor of Resurrection Church in Harlem, which was a Black church. In 1946, he's also writing all of the congregations in New York um, to see what their policies were related to admitting Black candidates. Um, he sort of writes a very genetic letter, but gets to it in his second paragraph. Is the order Catholic enough to accept colored vocation? I'm in a colored parish and I'm immediately concerned with this information. And the answer that he gets is no, 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 no. In fact, we know the mercies even write to the Vatican to sort of ask for some help because they just don't know what they're, what's going on. And in this particular emergency mission to the Vatican, um, they give us great insights into how white sisters um, approach the ideas of having black women within their ranks. Here, the superior of the Mercy community writes to the Vatican and closes a copy of a letter that I received from one of our mother's provincial rel relative to the acceptance of colored girls to our institute. The problem is forced upon us because of the number of colored students we now teach in our schools. Even though the reception of colored subjects would necessarily differ in some respects from the training of other subjects, the colored would no doubt resent a separate novitiate. It seems too at this time that the sisters in general would not welcome colored subjects in our, into our present novitiates. And this is significant for a host of reasons. One, it tells us that white sisters understood black women and girls call to religious life as problems before they ever step foot in the convent. They also admit that their communities are filled with women who do not like black women. They say they won't be welcomed. And it tells us among many things is that anti-blackness is not disqualifying for white sisters that that is not a disqualifying factor from religious life, that racism is not a problem, it is acceptable. And it gives us a sense of the kinds of barriers that Black women would face, not even as they are applying to religious life, but also the kinds of problems that they will face once they get into communities where they are generally not wanted. In the case of the Religious Sisters of Mercy in Chicago, they will never take one Black candidate. And they will educate thousands of black students in Chicago and not take one. We know that they're getting vocations and they refuse to accept one. Their first community member to admit to be admitted and remain is Sister Cora Marie Billings. She is the first African-American admitted into the Religious Sisters of Mercy in Philadelphia and likely the first US born black woman admitted into a congregation in Philadelphia. What we know about her is that she actually had two aunts who were rejected admission into the Mercy Sisters and all the white congregations in Philadelphia in the decade before her. Both of her aunts became Oblate Sisters of Providence and died as Oblate Sisters of Providence. Their father, Sister Cora Marie's grandfather, John Aloysius Lee Sr., was the second African-American graduate of Roman Catholic High School in Philadelphia, which is the nation's first um, Catholic high school. He is a prominent layman and becomes the first African-American to win the Vercelli Medal um, uh, from the Archdiocese of Philadelphia. He does another, he has sort of an amazing life in itself that I could talk about later. His father, William Henry Lee, is one of the enslaved people who labored for the Jesuits at Georgetown in DC. Again, sort of giving a sense of who these people are and this faithfulness that is surviving through the generations um, and allowing people to begin to desegregate religious life. I do briefly want to mention this uh, sister, pioneering Black sister, in honor of Black History Month. As I said, members of the Black Orders not only sort of teach Black history, many of them will go on to begin to desegregate Catholic colleges and universities in the era before the Brown decision, which I talk about in my book. But I also want to give us a sense of what's happening and remind people that members of the Black, the White Orders are also desegregating colleges when they enter those communities. And I want to give you this example um, um, because it's an example that I believe every person should know. This is Dr. Frances Douglas. 
1945, she became the first African-American woman admitted into the Daughter of the Heart of Mercy. She enters from Brooklyn. She goes on to earn her PhD from Fordham um, in 1951 um, and began a career in the academy in psychology. In 1956, she becomes the first African-American to head a department at DePaul University. And then in 1963, she'll become the first woman of color to head a department at Marquette University. What's significant about her experience in groundbreaking work in higher education, especially at DePaul, she, she becomes the first black department head at DePaul in 1956. Now, anyone who would tell you that we have all believed that the great historian, prominent black historian, Dr. John Hope Franklin is widely cited as the first African-American to chair a department at a historically white institution. But, Dr. Douglas, who was not known as a nun because the members of her community did not wear habits, she begins her tenure at, as the head of the psychology department at DePaul in the same fall of the same year as Dr. Franklin assumes the head of uh, Brooklyn College's history department. And so because we do not tell the stories of Black sisters, because we have ignored this history of the desegregation of higher education, Catholic higher education, when we begin to sort of talk about the kinds of feats that Black sisters um, achieve, they are monumental. And yet, because we don't tell the truth about Black sister stories, we don't even get a chance to champion Black nuns as desegregation pioneers. Um, and so I just wanted to make sure that I do that. And in my book, I make sure that I champion all of the Black sisters, especially the members of the Black sisterhoods, who desegregate Catholic colleges, universities, um, in the 20s, 30s, and 40s, again, before the Brown decision. And so even before we get to the civil rights movement, so many Black sisters had already broke boundaries and broke uh, barriers as the first Black members of their institutions and desegregating their colleges, their orders colleges, or desegregating the faculties of their order schools or the staffs of their, uh, their orders hospitals. Black sisters will certainly be marching in Selma, and some of sympathy demonstrations across the country, but it's important to understand that this is just an extension of the activism that was already taking place within their communities. So by the time that you get the formation of the National Black Sisters Conference, and you begin to see Black sisters publicizing their testimonies and their experiences of racism in religious life, some of whom are leaving, we have a sense of a very connected, um, in many ways, sort of seamless freedom struggle that would sort of bring us to the present. And even though the numbers of Black sisters, African-American sisters are dropping in the United States, I do want to also make a point to note that the numbers of African sisters who are ministering in the United States have helped to reverse the declining population of Black sisters in the United States. And I do want to end my presentation um, with um, a bit of reflection on the legacy of Black sisters. Um, and I'll leave us with the words of Sister Loretta Teresa Richards, who was the longtime superior of the Franciscan Handmaids of Mary in Harlem. When I asked her what she thought the greatest legacy of Black sisters was, she did not hesitate to respond. She said, the Catholic Church wouldn't be Catholic if it wasn't for us, that if we had not persevered in our vocations, if we had not answered God's call on our lives in the face of unholy discrimination, one can only imagine where the Black Catholic community would be, and perhaps most importantly, where the entire American Catholic community would be that we push the church to declare with their words and actions that black lives did matter. Um, and so I want to leave you with this legacy um, and I look forward to your questions. And I do hope um, that you all will get a chance to purchase the book for those of you who do not want a copy today. And hopefully again, I can answer many more of your questions once you um, fully know the story of the sisters, um, uh, the great sort of sisters, black sisters, um, who helped and fought to make our church truly Catholic. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Shannon, we thank you for all that we heard. And I wanted to tell uh, people that, again, that this was recorded, this presentation. So we will send you the link because I want to go back and, and watch again to see what, what it might be that I had um, forgotten or not heard well. So now we're going to uh, take some questions and we'll do this by you using the reaction, see the reaction button at the bottom of your screen. If you press that, you see where it says, raise hand. 
you'll raise your hand and it will bring you to the front. And I see Sister Eileen Riley has already figured it out. Do you look at her up there in the corner? And her hand is raised. So she's going to be our first questioner. Sister Eileen? Jane, thanks for that fabulous presentation. I'm wondering what the name of the book was that you mentioned that you first shared with Sister Martin DeForest. You said it was an earlier book? Yes. Um, I don't know if I want to say that because <laughs> I don't, and I don't mention it in my book. I give, I give uh, clues in my footnotes to what that book is. Um, in many ways, I would say it doesn't matter what book it is because very few books, no books, quite frankly, have told the story of Black sisters stories accurately and honestly. And I, and I should say, I'd even sort of say in my footnotes, I even sort of make the point that even Father Cyprian Davis um, does erase Sister M. Martin DeVore's Gray from the founding meeting of the Black Catholic Clergy Caucus. He does not mention this history of, of why the National Black Sisters Conference was founded. Um, they are founded because Sister M. Martin DeVore's Gray is there. She is invited by a Black priest and then she there's an attempt to reject her. And so there is this huge confrontation between this 25 year old black nun and these priests who were screaming at her, telling her to get out and she stands her ground. That is not mentioned at all in the book. In fact, um, the National Black Sisters Conference is relegated to, to one mention on a timeline. Sister Ann Martin DePore's Gray is not there at all. So my book sort of recovers that story. Um, but I say, I don't wanna say the other book um, just because it really doesn't matter. <laughs> I would, I, I'll just say that it doesn't matter um, because what we have, what we will know and learn about sort of Black sisters and their contributions to the civil rights movement, um, certainly the fight for Black power um, and the fight to desegregate Catholic higher education is not, is not documented anywhere. Um, and it's simply because historians of women religious, uh, historians of the church have not stepped foot in the archives of the Oblate Sisters of Providence, the archives of the Sisters of the Holy Family, um, and sort of regained and, and collected the stories of these Black sisters that really sort of explode everything that we have, all these timelines that we think we have, right, are exploded when we take Black sisters' lives seriously. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. You got a, a good answer to your, but you didn't get the answer you asked for, but that's great. That's <laughs> perfectly fine. Okay, we have someone else here, uh, Brenda Fincher from Kent, Washington. Thank you, and thank you, Dr. Williams. I was just, as you were uh, speaking there near the end, thinking today of the number of Blacks that have gone to the Protestant religions, I have to wonder as to if not for the efforts taken to keep Blacks out of religious life, where we are, and looking at where we are with both the priest and the sisters, none shortages today, and so having Blacks in the pews, that that is all, all reflected there. Absolutely. Um, I did not talk about it in, in detail, but the story of the lost vocations is something that the church really has to reckon with, right? Um, we reckon with it in terms of the church's just its practices of slavery and segregation. It's also its practices of colonialism, but really sort of the impact of these anti-Black admissions policies. Now, we don't have a true sense of how many vocations were lost. In the 1940s and then in the 1950s, a white Jesuit priest, his name was Father Raymond Bernard, did a series of surveys of the nation's communities of sisters to ascertain their policies uh, regarding their admission of quote, qualified Negro girls. Um, and so he publishes his results. And what's fascinating is in the fifties, not even half of the communities uh, of the more than 600 communities of, of sisters in the United States who are you know, white, historically white or white ethnic communities are willing to accept black women, right? Through the fifties, through America's civil rights years, um, that these communities are some of the fiercest strongholds of white supremacy and segregation. And between two years, he found that, I think it was like 1957, 1958, there were more than 200 vocations that were lost. Either they were rejected or they entered communities and, lost and, and left right after. And, and so what we know in the 20th century in particular, and that was the thing with the Mercy Sisters in Chicago, right? Chicago, they're not only educating thousands of black students, but Chicago becomes the second largest black Catholic population outside of the, uh, uh, the second largest black Catholic population in the nation and the largest black Catholic community outside of the South. And so when we're talking about y'all are not taking vocations, what does that mean? What's being lost? But if in the 20, in this period in 1950 to 1960, where we see explosive growth of the black Catholic community in Chicago, Detroit, uh, Philadelphia, <clears throat> Los Angeles, 
where are the vocations, right? And what are the what are the implications? On top of the fact, right, he found two, almost 200 and that's the stuff that was written down. Many of the women that I interviewed, they said, I didn't even write the community. I asked my teacher, I asked the visiting vocation director and I was told that they did not accept Negroes. The, voca the rejection is oral. So there's no written record. So we don't even have a sense of what has been lost. And when you think about it then, the church in certain ways has sealed its fate. Think about all those vocations that would have been produced because people, you know, some sisters were like, oh, you know, I felt the call, but I didn't act on the call until I saw this one, since I, until I saw Sister Cora Marie Billings one day, or I saw Sister Dolores Harrell one day. Um, so we really have to grapple with what the church threw away. They threw away vocations and we really need to sort of say exactly what that is because vocations come from God. So to deny somebody's vocation, you are engaging in an evil act, right? So I know I've interviewed sort of lay women who were rejected admission, some of whom are associates of communities now. Um, and they have these stories, um, but absolutely what you said. And when you combine sort of this very active suppression of vocations with the closings of Black Catholic schools and the closings of Black Catholic parishes. And I would also argue sometimes the closings of these offices for Black Catholics, it seems like life, the life of the community is being squeezed out of them. Um, and so for me, um, as someone who did not grow up in a historically Black Catholic parish, right? I grew up in a predominantly white Southern suburban parish. I didn't know anything. Um, and it's, it's, it's shocking how much I didn't know. I knew there were black priests because, you know, by the time I got confirmed, Memphis got its first black bishop in Bishop Terry Stive. And I was like, oh, they're black priests. It never even occurred to me. That's how far my mind was gone. I didn't even think about black nuns. And so you have to sort of think about what's being lost now, even among, especially among black Catholics who are not even in these spaces to be able to be able to access this history, especially sort of thinking about those of us who I think we're being undercounted too, who are members of white parishes or predominantly white parishes. So absolutely what you've said, um, that we really have to grapple with it. And the church is gonna have to grapple with the fact too, that in many ways it has sealed its fate. Um, certainly, you know, the vocations are coming from the global South, um, but in terms of the United States, um, racism, we need to understand how racism, right? It hurts people of color, right? But it also hurts everybody. And that's just something that we have to sort of recognize. White supremacy does not love white people either. Um, although it's hard to sort of convince people that, but yes. Well, thank you for that. It's interesting, as you say, again, of where you, how you grew up and you ended up doing this research that you ended up spending those hours and days in the archives. So it's- It's uh, providential wait. serendipity. I had no intention of pursuing topics in black Catholic history, not at all. <laughs> Well, and the, the other thing is the uh, fact that the young women did not even ask the orders that so often they ask their teachers. And I think that was um, Sister Thea Bowman is behind me here. And I think she went to her sisters and took her all the way from South to La Crosse, Wisconsin. Right. Okay, we have somebody up here, Sister Roberta Fulton. Yes, thank you. Uh, Dr. Shannon, thank you so much. I remember our first meeting when I was president of the National Black Sisters Conference and you started your venture. Uh, my, my question, this was so outstanding and it's bringing back so many memories of uh, knowing Sister Martin DePores Gray and at our 50th anniversary for the National Black Sisters Conference when she was there with us. And I think you were too, but I was uh, wondering how did you come up with your title for the book, Subversive Habits? It seems Thank like you. a play on the word of habits, but I, I'm just curious. Thank you. It actually comes from the National Black Sisters Conference. So in 19, oh goodness, and, I'm, and here's the, there's my, here, these are my uh, uncorrected page proofs here, and I'm going to make sure that I get the the, uh, the quote right, but it comes from the National Black Sisters Conference. I knew that that was going to be the title of the book as soon as I came across this quote in the archive. And it was produced in the National Black Sisters Conference's practicability study in 1972. And it began with the quote, education and religion are the first two subversive forces that an oppressed people can use to liberate themselves. Religion is the guts of all human life. It can be used to silence a people 
or deliver a nation. <clears throat> and that's where it came from. It's also sort of a double entendre, right? Sort of the subversive and then the habits, sort of that the idea of black women in habits is a subversive idea to sort of really sort of think about what it means um, that the color of, we all talk about the color of Christ, right? But the mm. color of Christ's brides also mattered. Right, to sort of think about the idea of a black bride of Christ in a world that imagines Christ as white. Like there are so many subversive elements to this on top of the actual subversive habits of a black woman ministering in the United States, serving a community. Um, and certainly when we're talking about sort of serving um, and creating sort of a black Catholic educational system, right? To, to be able to sort of, um, that one that affirms racial identity, racial pride, but also prepares a generation of people, right? That black sisters, right? They're like, you know, we're not just sort of committed to sort of Catholic education, but anti-racist education, but also building up race leaders, right? Um, mm. The chapter titled my second chapter, nothing is too good for the youth of our race is taken from a speech delivered by an oblate sister of Providence at a meeting of the Federated Colored Catholics in the 1930s. Mm. Um, and, um, again, sort of the, 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 the master's theses and PhD dissertations of Black sisters, right? They're this, these wonderful sort of sources that we have to get a sense of um, the political strategies of Black sisters. Um, what's really fascinating, there's a Oblate Sister of Providence, Mother Mary of the Council Baptiste, who was a former superior of the community. And she writes in her master's thesis from Villanova, her community desegregates Villanova in the 1920s, and she finishes her master's degree in 1939, 1938-39. And she literally sort of says, we are conservative radicals. And mm -hmm. she says, we have combined the conservatism of Booker T. Washington and the radicalism of Dr. Carter G. Woodson and W.E.B. Du Bois. And she says something so profound. She said, we, would, we know, um, she said, basically she said, I, I'm going to paraphrase her. We combine it because we would be foolhardy to advocate any theory or idea that would bring violence upon our heads or those of our pu pupils. We know that the South accepts this axiomatic white supremacy. That being said, we are never cringing on morality or anything like that to renounce wrong is wrong. We recognize the inhumanity of injustice of this biracial setup. So they're saying we're absolutely fighting racial injustice, right? But we're in the Catholic Church. Like we and we're also ministering in the Jim Crow South. We have to be careful or we will be killed. And that and that's not taken lightly. We know that the oblates are attacked in St. Louis. Um, the sisters of the Holy Family are attacked by the Klan in Texas. Um, the Oblates lose a school to arson that they believe um, was created by the Ku Klux Klan in Orangeburg, South Carolina. So we have these examples of these attacks on Black Catholic education as well, because proponents of white supremacy saw the power of Black schools, and particularly Black Catholic schools, because they were not under state supervision in the ways in which they could control other public school systems. And if they are under Black control, they are a profound threat um, in the Jim Crow South, and especially in the Protestant Jim Crow South. So black sisters are really doing political subversive work that we we haven't necessarily paid attention to. Um, again, because, and I'll just continue to say this, people have not stepped foot in the archives of these orders. Um, and, you know, I get so frustrated. You know, a lot of black sisters were allowed to die and we didn't get their stories. And that upsets me in ways in which I, I really don't even know to talk about because we've lost so much of this history because we've let women die and they are the ones who are carrying these stories. So absolutely. And so the great thing about the National Black Sisters Conference, right, is they, they sent their papers. They sent their papers to Marquette, um, which is what we also have to do. Black Catholics have to preserve their records. And we need the oral history, but we also need the archival record of what has been served. Thank you. Wow, thank you. Um, I don't see anyone there, but Joanne Kennedy, I do have a question in the chat. Would you like to uh, present that question? Oh, now someone is there, but I'll, Joanne? Yeah, I'm here. Uh, thank you. I, I have I've seen you, Sister uh, Shannon, so many times. And I, every time I love it. I just love your presentation. I'm so happy that you're doing it. I have pre-ordered the book. I'm a huge, I'm a fangirl, basically. I'm not embarrassed to admit I'm a total fangirl. Um, and I, I um, work on the Catholic Worker newspaper, and we publish you, uh, republish you as much as we can. Um, I just wondered if you, in your research, you've become aware of anybody doing a similar project around men's orders or even diocesan priesthood, just to um, also bring that story forward at all. 
Right. You know, the book that we have is Desegregating the Altar, right, um, which is older. Um, and we certainly need more people sort of doing this work, right? Um, even in my own work, I say, right, I haven't said everything there is to say about African American Sisters Journey. I'll be doing this forever. But not anyone that I know of in PhD programs um, doing this work. Um, we know that there are collections of oral histories that were collected by Black priests um, in the 70s. I know Father Cyprian Davis's papers that are at the Catholic University of America. Um, they have the records and the minutes of the Black Catholic clergy caucus. And there are points, right, where we can sort of identify folks um, um, and they were sort of keeping membership list records. But I don't know of anyone sort of doing this oral history work. Um, and it absolutely needs to be done. Um, and, but, and, I, and I think it's, I don't know if it'll be harder. I know I couldn't do it. I'm not, one, it's, it's hard, like I'm not a sister. So, you know, there are certain things I still could not get to as a lay woman doing this work. Um, but, and certainly I would say one would need, I think you need a bunch of people doing this work. I'll say this. Um, and I think you have to also recognize, and this is what any professionally trained oral historian has to learn, right? How you get people comfortable enough to share things. And what I've learned with the oral histories, for example, I don't go in and sort of ask a sister, sister about sort of her experiences of racism straight out, right? Like I ask about family. I sort of, it's two parts to my interviews because I want people to get comfortable. But we also have to recognize too, a lot of black Catholics have trained themselves not to tell these stories. Um, and that's even true. Um, and you know, even at the book, the end of my book, I sort of end with a quote from Dr. Patricia Gray from the 50th anniversary of the National Black Sisters Conference meeting in, 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 in New Orleans. And she, she's calling to sisters in the room who are still re reluctant to tell the stories their most difficult aspects of their journeys outside of NBSC circles. She's like, you can't protect them. You can't protect their congregations. You can't do it. So many people are protecting the church and protecting the congregations. And so sometimes they suppress um, you know, their stories. And I would assume the priests have those, will, will do that too. And I, and I say this in part because I know Dr. Patricia Gray knows many of the stories of the priests. When she was at the clergy caucus meeting, <clears throat> what was happening was that the men were telling their stories and it's a consciousness raising moment for her. And she's like, well, you know, one, you have to figure this out. She's like, I bet you, we have these stories too. Everybody has this abuse. But then there were other stories that she learned later. And, you know, this is, you know, and it, it, it shocked her. And she says, but I'm a sister. I can't do anything. I have no power in the church. So I had to tell a priest about what some of the things that were going on that were, you can imagine. Um, so I think that that's, that's going to be the difficulty, right? Um, I think you'll need a priest doing it. I think you'll need a lay person doing it. Um, but there's that question of how much you can get out of folks. Okay. Let me just, I'll just say that, but I think it absolutely needs to be done. Um, I think you also have to sort of grapple with some other factors that you may not have had to sort of take into account for, for black sisters. I'm not doing a good job of answering the question, but not that I know that people are, okay. one, they're not enough folks doing it, but even more so than that, um, I think there'll be different kinds of factors involved. Okay, they, it, it, we certainly in Baltimore need people to look at this, uh, but we have two people yet waiting for the, we'll take these last two questions. Sister Irma? Hi, Shannon, it's good to see you. Um, could you talk, when you were doing your interviews, did any of the sisters talk about the experience of having to, especially when you desegregated white orders, a simulation? Because it's one thing that, I mean, I entered way after the fact, but still, that that's an issue. Did any of them really divulge that with you? Absolutely. Um, they did in oral history interviews, but also in the 1960s and 70s, a lot of them talked about it. They wrote about it. Um, you know, um, there's a great article by Sister Teresa to Win that was published in America in 1968. And she talks about integrating her Catholic school and how her white sisters and the counter, you know, and her peers made her feel like the underdog so much so that she started to look down on her home life. She said, I love the spirituals, but I stopped saying it. I love soul food, but I never said it. We know that there are some communities that enforce sisters to assimilate, right? Um, in the case of Sister Thea Bowman, right? She has to stop breaking in song, right? She said, when she used to be happy, I would break in song. And then I was told that that was not, you know, that was not proper behavior. She dealt with teasings about her hair and her Southern mannerisms. Um, you know, there's one really, really horrific story 
um, by an African-American woman, um, her testimony, and if I can find it, I do want to read it because I think it's important. She was the, she was actually the second African-American school sister of St. Francis. Her name was Daniel Marie Miles. Uh, she was from Mississippi, from Yazoo City, Mississippi. Their first Black member was accepted in 1941, but she was explicitly told to pass for white. Like there are two members of that community that I know that they could not tell their students, they could not tell anybody else that they were white, um, that they were black. And so they were forced to, to pass for white. But Sister Daniel Marie talks about internalizing um, the hatred. She actually sort of even mentions that she used to pray for God to make her white so that they would, she would be acceptable to them. She said mm -hmm. that she would go into the recreation period, recreation time, she would walk up to her counterparts and they would say, no, get out of here, go away. And that was after everything she had done to be white, right? So you'll, it is well, well documented in the oral testimonies that I include, but also in the written record. And just to give you a sense of Black sisters at the first National Black Sisters Conference, there's one Black sister she's from New Jersey. She's originally from the Caribbean, but she entered a community in New Jersey. She said, I, I know you all remember my Freudian slip when I introduced my, myself as a white sister from a white community. Like the kind of stuff, or one sister from California had desegregated her community, was told about the National Black Sisters Conference, encouraged by her community to go. And she says to a teacher, I've never seen a Black, I've never seen a Negro sister before. And her teacher looks at her, is stunned, horrified, takes her in a room and makes her look in the mirror and says, who do you see when you look in the mirror? And it's, you know, and it's that awakening, right? That people had lost themselves in these communities. Sometimes it had been enforced, um, but absolutely. And a lot of it is the bullying. Um, you know, in the case of Sister Dolores Harrell, you know, they wouldn't touch her plates. They would not touch the cups. They burned her bed sheets. They burned the mattresses rather than use them. When she would get in the pool, they would all get out of the pool immediately as soon as she got in. I mean, what was done to some of these pioneering black sisters in white communities is, is it's almost unreal to sort of think about it. Um, but absolutely this enforced uh, assimilation, um, forcing them to sort of uh, adhere to the European cus uh, customs, denigrating African-American culture. There's one sister who said, you know, I even learned to mispronounce the words as my largely German community. I knew they were mispronouncing it wrong, but I just learned to mispronounce it. So when I would go home, I felt so estranged from my family. And so it was that point where I had to sort of, you know, and I, and I must say, some women leave religious life really to save their lives, um, save their health, but also save their identities and save their lives. So absolutely. Dan, and we'll have to read your book to see, to read the rest of these stories, huh? Thank you, Sister Irma. You know, we keep, we're getting more people with hands up now, but I did say Beth, Judy was on and, and Sister Jamie Phelps is the, going to be our last person. Beth, Judy, you've been waiting there. I'm glad it's not your real hand up like this. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. And I'll be very brief. And I just want to say thank you so much, Dr. Williams, um, for your hours mm -hmm. of research and writing this book. And thank you to CTA Maryland for hosting this. This is news to me, and I'm very, very sad. I, I didn't know. I had, I had such a positive experience with the sisters in the 70s. Um, late 60s and 70s in my all-white community talking to me about Dr. King and racial justice. So I just assumed that all sisters, you know, that that was kind of the norm because I had that lucky experience. I guess my question for you is, well, how can white Catholics, um, what can we do to, to heal this in our parishes? What, what do you recommend we do? Um, absolutely. I um, mean, I'll talk about it a little more in the afternoon, but I think the first absolute step that you have to take, it's not the only step, it's the first step that has to be taken is the actual acknowledgement. Um, we have to know exactly what every community did. Every community story is different, um, but it is grounded in racism. And, and that's just a fact. The church is founded in colonialism and, 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 sla and, and slavery and segregation. And so it infects every aspect of its institutions. And so the first step that I, I ask any community to do is to know exactly, go into your archives and know exactly what you did. Do you have a history of, of colonialism? Did your community minister in Native American residential schools? 
um, and 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 you're going to have to sort of begin to sort of grapple with the abuses that are be, you know that are being popularized now and widespread press. But also remember remember that Native Americans have been testifying to what had happened to them for decades. Um, does your community have a history of slavery? Does it have a history of sort of rejecting um, having administering schools that do not accept Black women or segregated schools, um, Black students? Um, and then go through the policies, go through your congregational minutes. Um, if you ministered in the African-American community and your community has no black members, that needs to be a major red flag. Um, and you have to begin to figure out what's going on. There are some communities that have taken the steps that can sort of provide a blueprint for you, but you actually need to know what you've done. And then the next step is to come up with a plan for how to make reparation. Um, a lot of that is the first, the next step is the formal apologies to women if they are still alive or to families, but also to begin to work with your, the victims of this who have suffered from this to figure out what reparation needs to look like based on your particular history. Um, and that could be easily sort of making sure that you revamp your formation programs to ensure that there is an anti, that anti-racism is at the heart of it. Um, whether that is maintaining and requiring people to sort of make sure that they know this history, read these history books, um, know the testimonies of Black women that were that were um, rejected. Um, but those are the first critical steps, um, sort of knowing exactly what your respective community, parish, whatever it may be, whatever institution it may be, actually did, its relationship to colonialism, slavery, segregation, and then in terms of orders, contacting women, apologizing, and then beginning to work with those communities to sort of see what can be done in terms of addressing systemic racism within the church and within society. Um, that's a very short answer, but my second um, presentation will go into that in greater detail. And I will make the PowerPoint in terms of my slides available to you and I'll email that to, to Joan so you all will have that as well. Thank you, that's great to know. We'll take our last question, Sister Jamie Phelps. Um, I really want, want to make some comments. First of all, Shannon, thank you for your profound work. Uh, it's groundbreaking. I hope you continue it and we will uh, wish you every success in your research. Uh, the question about priests, I did my work, my dissertation on John R. Slattery, who was the uh, unrecognized founder of the Josephite priests, whose primary mission is ministry to black people. Um, and I think you, if you look at some of that, uh, you can get some hint if you want to find out what happened uh, with with a black priests. Um, fortunately, when I entered my congregation, they were not prepared for black women. Um, mm -hmm. I loved my sisters; that sisters loved me. My vocation came at an early age, when I was young. And the, my confessors, when I was going for after I made my, my first communion, blah blah blah. Uh, my, my priest started mentoring me and, and, and cultivating my vocation and vocation directors cultivated my vocations. Uh, when I finally got to the congregation, the formation directors uh, did welcome me. Uh, my father was concerned about what would happen to me. And uh, when he asked me, I'd say, well, they treat me like they treat everybody else. And that was sort of tongue in cheek because they were strict. <laughs> <laughs> but they were strict on everybody. It wasn't about the race. It was about strict on everybody. Um, our vocations are from God. And so this is very, very serious stuff. When people refuse to accept Black men and women into religious life and to priesthood, they're really countering the will of God. And I don't understand how people can deal with that. Or I don't understand what the consequences of that is going to be, quote unquote, in the kingdom. Um, there's not gonna be a segregated heaven that I know of, whatever that is or wherever it is. Uh, so I, I, I'm glad that we're at the point that we're talking about it, but talk is only the first stage. Uh, I got to the point where I had a lot of young black women who uh, were working with me, collaborating with me in ministries out there in the field. And they would come to the mother house and they loved the sisters. But when I invited them to consider a vocation, they said, no, they're now very active, prominent lay women in black women in the church. But there's something when God calls, he calls for a reason. We can all get to heaven as well. You don't have to be a, a, a religious to be get to heaven. But when God calls, 
it's a way that God is asking you to follow. And for me, it would have been sinful for me not to follow because it would be against the will of God. Um, and I just think we have to examine our conscience and make, as you say, Shannon, make reparation. And you make reparation by uh, providing money for lay ministry training programs by, uh, I'm not sure black women, contemporary black women are gonna enter religious life because you, you can be very active in church related ministry without being a sister, without doing the vows. So I don't know what God's will is relative to this issue, but we do have to admit our sins and make a firm purpose of amendment. And if some black women do approach us, uh, we welcome them with open arms and then seek the consultation with the National Black Sisters Conference so that we can mentor and help those young women. That's what I did with the five that entered me and left. <laughs> entered our, uh, I mentored them, I tried to walk with them so to help them negotiate uh, this. And some of the women remain racist, they still, they see, I'm glad I have dark skin, so there's no question of me passing. I would, probably wouldn't have done it anyway, because the way the Phelps are, we're just like there, you know? <laughs> but, but, but we really have to examine this. You are re resi we're resisting the reality that we all came from the same father, mother, God. So we are all really brothers and sisters under the skin. And the variation of the skin and the cultural gifts that Blacks and Hispanics and Asians bring to the church and to the world are being wasted. And that's probably why we're in the crap that we're in right now with the racism in Congress, the racism in the world, the Klan is rising again and my mother house sits in a territory that's surrounded by the Klan. I'm so glad our doors are locked. <laughs> I'm just trying to be hubris, <laughs> but, no, but truly, Racism is a sin. Pope Francis has emphasized that. Pope Francis has embodied and is welcoming everybody in the church. And we Catholic Christians must do the same thing. End of my OP preaching. <laughs> oh no, thank you. Um, thank you so much. I did want to say though, um, and I'll probably, and I'm going to leave on this. It's going to be 30 seconds. Um, I think the other piece of it is there are, I do know, and I interviewed at least three black women, African-American women who entered religious life um, under the age of 30, um, who had been very active in various campaigns and two of them have left. Um, and so something is still wrong. Um, we know that African-American sisters still suffer acts of overt you know, racism and unconscious bias. It exists within communities. But we also know is that there are formal and informal policies and anti-Black admissions policies that are still existing. I've literally been contacted by white sisters and communities who were like, my community will not accept Black women. And that's what said to me in 2022. I know the names of the community. So the other piece of this is that this, this, this history is still with us. It's not a history. It's still very much a part of our present. But, but thank you so much. And again, Thank you all for the opportunity. Um, I'm just so looking forward to uh, this afternoon's conversation. But thank you so much, Sister Jamie, as always. And thank all of you um, uh, for just the opportunity this morning. One more comment. First church, Catholic church, was in Africa. The flight to Egypt. Egypt is in Africa. Now, I'm not talking about who Jesus was. Right. I, won't go, I won't go there, but you don't fly someplace where you're going to be obvious. <laughs> right, right. So I say to him, he was not white and blue eyed like many of my white friends. He probably <laughs> wasn't as dark as I am. But you don't go someplace where you're going to stick out like a sore thumb. Thank you, Sister thank Jamie. You. And thank you for all, we got a little extra of getting a, a piece of you in here. And I'm sorry about this. I wrote down Mary Ellen Meckley and Grace Byerly had their hands up and we'll take you first in the afternoon for questions. Okay. And Dolores and Tony, we're going to start with your um, words this afternoon because I have a feeling people are getting uh, ready to get up and also I thought we were going to have lunch now but some people out there 
uh, maybe having breakfast or brunch if you're coming from uh, <laughs> another place. Dolores, is that okay if you come on and, and Tony this at the beginning of the afternoon? One thing, Rudy, do you want to tell them about um, signing off or should I? Rudy's going wants to, he's going to sign out of this. Um, and so you're going to need to sign out and then come back in with the same link at one. And we're going to open up at 12. That was my question. That was my question. Yes. Oh, yes. Question? Uh, we'll sign back in in the same link. And don't worry if you can't find it. I'll make sure I'll send you the email um, over again. So it's just so it'll be fresh in your you know list. So um, we'll be back in. I don't know, 15 minutes or so. <laughs> well, sign in early. 1245 uh, 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 is when we can come on. Sometimes people like to talk to people on the on, on the computer with them. It's up to you, but you can come back at that time at one o'clock. We'll start. Actually, absolutely at one o'clock this time. One okay? o'clock central time. So, oh, I'm sorry. 12 o'clock central. You'll have Thank to figure you. it out. One o'clock Eastern time, and I'm going to take your name off now, Mary. Uh, Mary, thank Ellen, you. What's your question? Okay, Grace, we'll take yours first. Then, everybody, have a great a rest. Get up, and and I'm waiting to get up and move around. And Shannon, we'll be looking forward to hearing you again in the afternoon. Thank you so much. A wonderful for a wonderful morning. And if you haven't, if we had a chance to read the the things in the chat, there are some interesting things. Look at, look at Deb Rose's uh, comment. Okay, farewell till, for a little bit.